Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and today we'll be covering topic 6.8, which is solar energy. Our objective for the day is to be able to describe how solar energy is used to generate power, but also to be able to describe the environmental effects of generating solar electricity. The skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video will be explaining trends in data. So the first thing we'll do today is talk about the difference between passive and active solar. So passive solar is this idea that we can either absorb the sun's heat or we can block the sun's heat. And we can do this without the use of mechanical or electronic equipment. So one example is just using a solar oven. So this is basically a piece of reflective material, sometimes plastic surrounding, and you put the dish inside of it and the sun's energy can be concentrated and can heat the dish up. Another example is just orienting uh, your building design. So you can take advantage of either blocking the sun's rays during the warmer seasons or allowing more of the sun's rays in during the cooler seasons to naturally heat or cool your home. So we call this sustainable building design and some examples would be double paned windows. So these windows would trap uh, the sun's energy when it comes in and warms up the floor or the brick walls. And then that would keep you a little bit warmer in the winter. You could also have Southern facing windows, uh, especially in the Northern hemisphere. We'll talk about in a diagram here in a second, how that is helpful. You can also have roof overhang. So because of the angle of the sun in the Northern hemisphere during the summer, the sun is higher in the sky. And so again, it'll be really helpful to understand that once we see this diagram here in a second. You can also have deciduous uh, shade trees. So those will be trees that are, you know, have broad leaves and the leaves will fall off during the winter. So that lets more sunlight hit your house and warm it up a little bit, but it keeps your house a lot cooler in the summertime. So the leaves will absorb a lot of the sun's rays and it keeps your house from warming up uh, due to the sun's energy. Another thing is to have dark colored floor or as I alluded to earlier, you know, brick or a good heat absorbing material on your walls so that when the sunlight comes through in those winter months, it can be absorbed and turned into heat. So let's take a look at active solar now. Active solar is when we do use a mechanical or electric equipment to capture the sun's energy. And sometimes we'll use that to heat water into steam to create electricity, or we can just directly turn the sun's rays into electricity through the use of PV cells or photovoltaic cells, which we know as solar panels, uh, sort of in common language. Um, another method that we can do here is what's called a solar water heater. And so this helps to see the diagram now that I'm referring to. So if we take a look here, what happens is you have this sort of, you know, apparatus on your roof. And when the sun's rays hit this apparatus, there's either water or some sort of cooling liquid in here that's heated up by the sun's energy. It goes into this uh, storage pump and then it is basically used to heat your home. So you can have hot water, you know, when you take a shower, or you can just actually pipe that water underneath the floor and kind of use the ambient heat that's released to heat your house. Then if we look at sustainable building design, as I mentioned earlier, some components of sustainable building design, again, would be this idea that you can have a shade tree to block the sun in the summer, but allow it to come through in the winter. In the Northern hemisphere, when you have Southern facing windows, what it allows you to do is capture that winter sun, which is lower in the sky due to the Earth's tilt. It comes through the window, it hits these heat absorbing surfaces and it gives you a little natural heating effect. And that's where those double paned windows can then trap some of that natural heat. The nice thing about these Southern facing windows with a roof overhang in the Northern hemisphere is that in the summer, when the sun is higher in the sky, you take advantage of this natural sun blocking design with your roof overhang. So again, that's the difference between solar uh, in terms of active and solar in terms of passive uh, energy use. So the next thing we'll do today is talk about photovoltaic cells, which we know in common language as solar panels. So these are panels that have a semiconductor metal in them. And these are metals uh, like silicone that are going to emit a low voltage just when they're exposed to sunlight. So we'll talk about exactly how they do that here. Basically what happens is the photons, which are energy carrying particles uh, from the sun, these come and they hit the semiconductor and there's two different layers of the semiconductor. So if we look at the diagram here, we can see uh, you have a P layer and an N layer, and then they're separated by this kind of barrier here, the junction. When that photon hits the top layer of silicone, it causes the electrons to flow in one direction and the protons to flow in another direction. Those electrons are then diverted through an alternate path. And that path is going to be basically what we call a circuit. The circuit is going to go to a load and so the electrons are gonna flow through the load. The load is just whatever it is that we're powering with this electricity. It could be a light, it could be an outlet, it could be your washer, or your dryer. And so then they uh, flow through that circuit and they complete 
their cycle by filling back in on the other side. And so this is the basic idea here of how we can generate electricity directly using these uh, photovoltaic cells, which remember just is fancy lingo for solar panels. Now we can have these photovoltaic cells or these solar panels uh, directly on the roof of a building, and then they can provide the electrical needs of that building itself. But what's really nice about solar panels is they can direct excess electricity back onto the grid. So if this house is able to produce more electricity with the solar panel than it uses, it can actually send that electricity back onto the grid and the utility, which is the company that sells power, will actually send you a rebate or a check in the mail typically if you're producing more electricity than you consume. So it can even be a way to generate a little extra income in addition to you know, reducing your house's greenhouse gas emissions. Then if we look at a drawback of solar that we have to be aware of, it's intermittency. Intermittency is this idea that solar power is not available 24 seven. Obviously, you know, depending on the season, it gets dark for half the day or more, depending on where you are on earth. And so solar panels are just not always an option to generate electricity. Another issue here is that when we generate lots of electricity during the day, we don't necessarily have a way to store it and save it up and then use it later at night. So this presents us with a problem that has been referred to as the duck curve. So what the duck curve shows is that if we have our net load, which is basically how much electricity we would normally need minus all of our solar energy, what happens is we have a relatively stable demand. And then in the morning, when the sunlight comes up, we start producing all of this solar electricity. And so the net load, which is basically what needs to be made up by our fossil fuel generation, you know, not our photovoltaic cells, drops dramatically because we're producing so much solar. And that seems like a good thing, except for the problem is then when we get closer to nighttime, uh, solar energy obviously goes offline. We can't use it anymore. And it coincides with the point in the day when electricity demand starts to ramp up anyway. So what we get is these massive, massive increases where fossil fuel sources or nuclear sources have to rapidly ramp up their electricity production, basically to make up for the slack in solar going offline. And so this graph that, again, we refer to as the duck curve is really the big drawback to solar. It's the main challenge to expanding solar to be a wider and wider uh, sector of our total electricity production. Now we'll talk about another form of active solar energy, which is called concentrating solar thermal or CST. So in CST energy production, what we get here is a bunch of heliostats. And heliostats are basically mirrors that reflect and concentrate sunlight onto a central tower. So we can see that if we look in the picture here to the right. And the goal of this is to superheat uh, some form of heat carrier. So this could be actually a molten salt, as we'll talk about in a second, or even an oil. And then that oil is used to turn water into steam. Now, a drawback of this is habitat destruction. So these mirrors do displace the habitats of organisms. Oftentimes it is in the desert, and so they're not necessarily the most biodiverse habitats, but they are habitats, and organisms do uh, lose their home when we set up a large CST array. Another problem, uh, not necessarily like the biggest problem, probably not an FRQ worthy answer, um, but birds can actually be basically zapped or fried out of midair by these super, super, super concentrated light beams that the heliostats are concentrating on this central tower. Uh, and so what we can do here is look at a diagram where we can understand this a little better. So again, you have the heliostats. These are basically the receivers or the mirrors. They focus all of that solar energy on the central tower. The central tower gets extremely hot. And what we do is we pipe some form of liquid in there. So again, it could be a molten uh, salt that's basically able to take tons and tons of heat on and then be carried over to this tank and then eventually go to a boiler or what we could think of as a heat exchanger where that molten salt will transfer all of the heat uh, that it's stored by those concentrated sun rays to water. And then that water becomes steam, which of course spins a turbine, which powers a generator, which you guessed it, generates electricity. Um, so just like probably the 50th time now that we've gone through this whole heat, steam, turbine generator sequence. Uh, so if you don't have it by now, you really need to have it down. Uh, that is super critical for electricity generation. Let's talk about though now the difference between rooftop and community solar. So this is kind of an FRQ pro tip here. When referring to solar panels, especially as an electricity solution, you know, or a way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we don't wanna just say solar panels. 
we want to differentiate between either community solar or rooftop solar. Now, community solar can sometimes be referred to as a solar farm. So we can see here a solar farm is basically an area that's dedicated totally to solar electricity production. Um, so we have to be aware of that. That's a different idea than just putting in small amounts of solar panels on individual buildings. So large scale solar farms, while they're going to produce a lot of electricity, are going to lead to habitat loss, habitat fragmentation. And then if we were to talk about uh, rooftop solar, these are a great solution for individual buildings. Uh, you know, you could decrease the carbon footprint of your school or of your home by adding rooftop solar. But adding rooftop solar is not necessarily going to bring, you know, a total grid electricity solution. So while it doesn't take up land and it doesn't destroy habitats, it's not going to replace huge, you know, fossil fuel powered power plants because they're so small and spread out. And finally, we'll wrap up today by just recapping some environmental uh, pros and cons of solar energy that we've already talked about, but we need to just kind of make sure we have down here. So in terms of pros, uh, there's going to be no air pollutants, so no particulate matter, no SOx or NOx released when we're generating electricity. We should make that distinguishment there between generating electricity and doing the actual mining uh, to produce the silicone that's needed in these PV cells. There's also going to be no carbon dioxide released, so we're not going to contribute to the greenhouse gas when actually generating electricity. And again, I want to emphasize that um, there is an environmental consequence we'll talk about in a second. Uh, and these are going to be renewable resources. So that's another great thing. We can continually harvest the sun's energy over and over. It does not run out. Fossil fuels are sure to do eventually. And then there's no mining of fossil fuels for electricity production. Now, unfortunately, we do have some drawbacks of solar we have to be aware of. Um, so one is that these semiconductor metals that go into the solar panels, they still need to be mined. So we may still have habitat fragmentation or destruction. We may still have water pollution from the mine tailings. And again, this is a resource that is limited. So we have finite amounts of silicon on Earth. And so it's not going to be here uh, forever. And then if we're talking about the environmental consequences, uh, or ecological, I should say, habitat loss, as I mentioned earlier through the mining. And even if we're talking about solar farms due to the actual, you know, setup of the panels itself. And so, again, these are some pros and cons that we have to be aware of with solar energy. So for practice FRQ 6.8 today, I want you to take a look at this graph and the diagram that's below it. And then I want you to try to explain the relationship between the tracking ability of a solar PV system and its energy production.